actually Richard Taylor, and he's speaking, as you can tell, on potential on market. Thank you. Um, uh, well, thank you, Mark, for the invitation to speak. Um, always the experts feel obliged to come, so my apologies to the experts that uh, this is supposed to be a colloquium talk, so I'm going to try not to address them, but to address the rest of the audience. Um, also, a word of warning, this is the first time I've tried to use this technology, so anything may happen. <laughs> but uh, I do, yes. <laughs> Having been to all the postdoc talks, I felt I had to try and... Uh, keep up. Okay, well, my uh, subject is potential automorphy. Um, <coughs> so I should first of all uh, sort of say what automorphy is and, and what it's good for. Um, so we're going to be concerned with a polynomial equation. So have some number of polynomial equations in some number of unknowns with uh, rational coefficients. And in fact, as there are only a finite number of them there, the denominators will be bounded, so I only need to invert one integer to get all the, uh, see all the coefficients. And then rather than looking for solutions of these equations in the uh, rational numbers, which is maybe the original uh, sort of Diophantine problem, we're going to be concerned with the easier question of trying to understand the solutions uh, modulo various integers, in particular modulo prime numbers, uh, may be uh, originally in the hope that this sheds some light on the original Diophantine problem, but also simply because it uncovers uh, such a lot of structure uh, that I think it becomes interesting in its own right. So given our set of polynomial equations, I'm going to consider the system of simultaneous congruences, modulo a variable prime p, and this will make sense for any prime p that didn't divide the, uh, the denominators, the various denominators that come up. And we're going to ask questions about uh, the number of solutions. Can one predict the number of solutions in some way? Uh, and can one say something about the statistics of the solutions? Uh, even if one can't produce precise formulae, can one say how, how the number is going to vaguely behave? in terms of maybe the number of variables, the number of equations, the, uh, the degrees of the polynomials, and so on. So rather than uh, writing down a bunch of equations the whole time, uh, which can be done. I once, as an undergraduate, I had a course in algebraic number theory in which the lecturer, instead of using the word ideal, would carry around a list of elements of a number ring, which were the generators of an ideal with an equivalence relation that was meant they generated the same ideal. But <coughs> I'm not going to follow his, uh, his example. Uh, so I'm going to denote this system of equations by x, call it a scheme or a variety. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that it's, it's smooth and projective, so that it has no singularities, and in fact I'm going to augment that integer n so that the reduction modulo p is smooth for, uh, for all, all the primes that don't divide n. And projective, well maybe I should really think about uh, uh, homogeneous equations and consider two th sets of solutions that are uh, multiples one of the other to be the same, but uh, it's not going to be so important uh, at the level of this talk. Well, one thing we can do, one way uh, one can try and package the information of the number of solutions is to introduce the, the zeta function. We, we'll talk about other ways later, but to begin with, let's talk about the, the zeta function. I simply look at, for each solution, little x over any finite field, finite field over varying prime p, I form the expression, the well, and it need not just be a mod p, it can be in a finite extension of the finite field with p elements. Uh, I form the, exp so it could be, if I'm clever I can point, uh, could, the, could be defined with coefficients in some field fp to the r, the finite field with p to the r elements. And then I include here a factor, 1 minus uh, p 
p to the minus r s all to the minus 1. And then I form this enormous uh, product in over all primes and then over for each prime over all points, which is a somewhat complicated thing to do, but it does in some way uh, contain information about the solutions to those equations, modulo of variable prime p. And one can ask about the properties of such a zeta function. Um, one can see that it converges to an analytic function in some right half plane, real part of s greater than 1 plus the dimension of the uh, variety cut out by those equations x. Uh, and before saying anything else, let me give some examples. If I just take a point, well, modulo p, there's just one point. It's, it's already defined over the field with p elements. So the term for each prime p, there will just be one point to consider. And the term I put here will just be 1 over 1 minus p to the s inverse. And when I take the product over all those primes, uh, expand this as a geometric series and multiply out using the uniqueness of prime factorization, I get sum of 1 from 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the s, just the standard Riemann zeta function. Uh, a slightly more complicated example, if I take an elliptic curve, this is uh, <clears throat> a plane cubic. So a and b are to be thought of as constants, coefficients of them. We've just got one polynomial in two variables. It's cubic. It has one rational point, which has been put at infinity. And it can always be put in this form, y squared equals a cubic. And if you calculate its zeta function, well, you end up with the product of the Riemann zeta function, a translator of the Riemann zeta function, dif divided by another Euler product, another L series, which I've called the L function of E. I've written here. Again, it's an infinite product over primes p, an Euler product. But now with the great advantage over the original definition that there's only one factor uh, for each prime p instead of an infinite number. It's just a polynomial in p to the minus s with these terms being obvious, the one unknown coefficient just encapsulates the number of solutions to the congruence. y squared is congruent to x cubed plus ax plus b modulo p. Uh, so it's the difference between that and 1 plus p. And I guess I should really, I said they were supposed to be projective, so I should have included the point at infinity. Well, this uh, behavior that these things factorize is. Uh, a general behavior. Um, if I have a general smooth projective variety x, I get a product over two dim x plus one terms, uh, which I will come back to in a little bit to say a bit more about what they are. Um, we expect that they, these functions that are initially defined in some right half plane should have a meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane. And they should satisfy a simple functional equation which relates the value at s to the value at 1 plus the dimension of x minus s. And one also expects that the special values of these functions, when one substitutes special, uh, value, special values for the complex variable s, say uh, an integer, maybe a particular integer typically, that that should encode information about the arithmetic of x. Uh, Maybe the number of rational points on x, even if you're very lucky, or aspects of the arithmetic of x in characteristic zero. So it's a rather remarkable, well, both of these are rather remarkable. There's no a priori reason why this thing sh should, should have analytic continuation or functional equation. And there's certainly no reason why sort of counting the solutions to congruences should somehow tell you about the arithmetic of the <coughs> a variety in characteristic zero. So if we go back to our two examples, the Riemann zeta function, if, it's, if you modify it by gamma factor and an exponential, then the resulting function has the property that its value at s is the same as 1 minus s, as Riemann showed in 1860. So it does have this property of meromorphic continuation and functional equation. And also, it is related to the study of arithmetic. Uh, in this case, the herbrand ribet theorem says that it, at negative odd integers, the value of the Riemann zeta function happens to be a rational number. 
again, I think a fairly remarkable fact if you just take this transcendental function and continue it and then evaluate it at some integer, there's no a priori reason why you should suddenly get a rational number. That this was a rational, yes, I'm not saying it's not old. Yeah, yes, sorry, w when I attribute it to Herb Brandon Ribbert, it's this part of the theorem I'm attributing to <laughs> Herb Brandon Ribbert. I, my apologies. This is an old, but, but I still think non obvious fact. And here I've indicated that it contains uh, arithmetic uh, information. A prime p divides the uh, special value, which we now know, or the numerator of this rational number, if and only if a certain part of a certain class group is, is non-trivial. So I don't want to spend a long time explaining this, but here we have uh, the ring of integers in a cyclotomic field, just all expressions you can get by using addition and multiplication on the usual integers plus the pth root of unity. You, in that ring, you can try and do factor integers in the same way as you factor rational integers. You don't have in that case, unique factorization. But the failure is measured by a finite abelian group called the class group. And I'm looking at the p part of that class group. And that p part uh, decomposes under the action of, the, of a Galois group, cyclic group, or, the, or z mod pz cross. And this, I'm taking one eigenspace of that action. So this is some information about the failure of uh, unique factorization in this ring of integers. And that's non-trivial if and only if p divides uh, the special value of the zeta function. And then there's a, a slightly similar space, which that implies that would also be non-zero. These, these things were studied extensively, uh, at least partly, probably largely, um, because approaches to Fermat's last theorem for about 100 years were, were largely based on the study of these sorts of things. This, this method never somehow converged, but it did produce an extremely beautiful theory. Uh, now, going on to the second of my examples, the case of an elliptic curve. Again, it was proved, uh, starting with the work of uh, Andrew Wiles, and completed by a group of us about 10 years ago, that again, the uh, the zeta function does have meromorphic continuation to the whole complex plane and satisfies a simple functional equation. So here, oops, here uh, n is some uh, integer which is easily calculable in terms of e, and plus or minus is, is a sign that again depends on the exact e you chose. Don't you always want an l there? Not exactly. No, I want a zeta. No? Otherwise, I'd put gamma factors and things in as well. I mean, the, the H0 and the H2 also satisfy a functional equation between them. And if you put them in, the gamma factors go, as far as if I didn't make a mistake. Um, but I, it, yeah, it's equivalent to the same thing for L. And um, again, uh, <coughs> we believe, though this came, we don't know, we believe that the special values of this thing uh, have profound implications about the arithmetic of the elliptic curve. For instance, the Birch, Swinnett, and Dyer conjecture predicts that, well, this zeta function will always have a pole at s equals 1 because of the, the zeta function in the numerator. But if you remove the obvious pole, the resulting thing uh, <coughs> is, is, will still have a pole at s equals 1 if and only if there were infinitely many rational solutions to your original cubic equation in two variables. That's what I mean by E of Q. So if, that, if y squared is equal to x cubed plus ax plus b for infinitely many rational values x and y, then this thing will get an extra pole at s equals 1. Okay, no, <coughs> no apparent connection between <coughs> those things. Well, the only way I've, I've ever seen any of these sorts of things tackled is via the theory of Galois representations and automorphic forms, at least in, in some sense. And <coughs> this, is, this is what automorphy is going to be. Automorphy is going to be a way of getting information about these questions through uh, 
through the study of discrete subgroups of Lie groups and, and much analytic objects, automorphic forms. Well, uh, as there are two things here, so I'll come to the automorphic things in a minute. Let me first of all say how the Gawa representations come into the picture. So we had, back here somewhere, this uh, factorization. I told you that the zeta function was a product of other uh, Dirichlet series, which I called L series. Uh, well, where does that come from? That comes from looking at the cohomology of the variety. If I just take the complex points of the variety, that's a smooth manifold, so I can look at its usual, uh, for instance, singular cohomology, but that doesn't uh, appear to carry much uh, arithmetic number theoretic information, but if instead of taking complex numbers or rational numbers or integers of coefficients, I take the elladic numbers as uh, coefficients, for some auxiliary prime L, which we just have to choose, then this, as Gross and Dieck showed, this group can be defined uh, al purely algebraically. Uh, so I reminded you here that the uh, elladic numbers are the completion of the rational numbers with respect to the al elladic absolute value. There's an absolute value. Which two things are close if they're their difference is highly divisible by L. And once this such a thing has an algebraic definition, algebraic symmetries can reasonably be expected to act on it. So, in fact, the Galois group of Q, absolute of Galois group of Q, will then act as automorph continuous automorphisms of this uh, now elladic vector space. So, very briefly, the uh, algebraic... Q bar here is the field of algebraic numbers. That's all, for instance, all complex numbers as the solutions of uh, one variable polynomial equations with uh, rational coefficients. And this Galois group, thing I call the Galois group, is just all automorphisms of the field of algebraic numbers. That's bijections that preserve the uh, operations of addition and multiplication. So this is some large uh, profile, technically has a topology, a profinite group. And this is a finite dimensional vector space over the alladic numbers. And then this is a continuous representation, so-called alladic representation, a continuous representation of this topological group on this finite dimensional uh, alladic vector space. Well, these, uh, sorry, these representations have a number of extremely important properties, which I want to briefly go through next. Uh, first of all, they're what's called unramified almost everywhere, at all, at all but finitely many primes. Now, I don't want to say what this means, but the Galois group of Q bar over Q is somehow populated with elements called Frobenius elements attached to the various primes. Now, I don't want to be too precise, but you can't al they're not quite elements of the group, so you can't always quite make sense of uh, evaluating a representation at such an element. But if, when rho is unramified at p, you do get this well-defined conjugacy class uh, in uh, the automorphisms of your elladic vector space. So there's something, just, uh, there's something that allows us to associate a conjugacy class in GLN to each uh, pro or all but finitely many prime numbers p. Uh, Secondly, the Galois group of Q bar over Q, the Galois group of QL bar, the algebraic closure of QL over QL, embeds in the Galois group of Q bar over Q as a, as a closed subgroup, a rather small closed subgroup, and I can form the restriction. And you, this is far from being a random representation of this so-called decomposition group at L. It's something called Duram. And again, I don't want to go into what Duram means, but it has, on this small subgroup, it has some very special property. This contains an awful, this restriction does contain an awful lot of information. For instance, it encodes all the Hodge numbers of the variety X, so that uh, from this representation we can recover the dimensions of the pieces of the Hodge decomposition of the complex, uh, <coughs> the cohomology of the complex points. These dimensions are sometimes called the Hodge Tate numbers. 
uh, the way of recovering them was discovered by Tate, or at least was conjectured by Tate. Um, and finally, these special uh, conjugacy classes, these Frobenius conjugacy classes, are not, uh, <coughs> are not just any old, they satisfy a strong rationality condition. Instead of being a general conjugacy class in GLN of the Eladic numbers, they actually live in, well, either the rational numbers or the algebraic numbers. And the conjugacy class you get is independent of the prime L you chose to form the cohomology. So you, for each L, you have this uh, representation <coughs> of the Gawa group of Q bar over Q, and they somehow come together at these special points, which are the Frobenius elements, where everything's rational. And then at the other points, they move continuously eladically, but they can sort of live in completely different worlds at other elements of the Galois group. And moreover, there's a, not only do they, are they in some sense rational, they satisfy this thing called purity, which says the absolute value of their eigenvalues is given very precisely by the degree of the cohomology in which you're looking. Well, given... Uh, <coughs> Given that we have these properties, I can associate now an Euler product to this representation, to the ith cohomology. I take basically the characteristic polynomial of these Frobenius elements. These will have essentially rational coefficients, so they sit inside the complex numbers. So I can make a, comp a function of a complex variable s by taking the product of these characteristic polynomials at p to the s, essentially, over all primes p. And <coughs> Because of uh, Deligne's purity theorem, this will converge to a holomorphic function in a right half plane again, and it will be independent of the prime L. And the factorization we're looking for is given exactly by these uh, L, L, L functions associated to the, to the various cohomology groups. Well, to define an, an L function for a cohomology group, I don't need uh, to particular to take the uh, a Gawa representation, an Eladic representation coming from the cohomology of a variety. I could just start with any Eladic representation that had the various properties that we that we know that these had, had these three properties. So I could, so for any such thing, I can define such an L function, and I just remark in passing that it's clear, from the definition, it's clearly additive. The L function of the sum of two representations is their product, so I really only need to look at irreducible Eladic representations. So you could ask the question, do you get any more this way? Uh, if I try to study Gawa representations instead of the cohomology of varieties, do I get anything new? Well, Fontaine and Mazur, about 20 years ago, suggested that, in fact, a very influential conjecture suggests that, in fact, you don't. Any irreducible Eladic representation satisfying the first two properties, that it's unramified almost everywhere and, and satisfies this Durham representation, they suggest should come from geometry, should be contained found inside the cohomology of some smooth projective variety. In particular, by Deligne's theorem, it will be pure. It will satisfy this purity condition. So we could define an L function for it. And then uh, finally, they suggest that uh, it should come from the automorphic world. There should be a cuspidal automorphic representation. <coughs> I've written GLN of the Adels. I'll say something about what that means in a minute. Whatever it is, you can associate L functions to those things as well, and the L function should be equal. And this is, I will refer to this as saying that the Gawa representation was automorphic. And the point of this is, it will, whenever it's true, it will give a completely different construction for this L function, a completely different algorithm uh, for calculating the terms, which we saw were essentially counts of the number of solutions to poly polynomial congruences. So it will give you 
if you like, an algorithm for counting the number of solutions to polynomial congruences using things that have nothing to do with polynomial congruences, namely discrete groups, the cohomology of discrete groups, uh, or certain uh, analytic functions. Uh, well, I'm afraid I'm not going to say much more about what I mean by cuspidal automorphic representation. They're, they're representations of a certain group, and, and what are they representations on? They're representations on uh, vector spaces of functions, uh, in the case of GLN, of uh, vector spaces of functions of uh, positive definite symmetric real n by n matrices, which are invariant uh, under the action, uh, the congruence action of GLN Z on those matrices. So when they're studied, you often involve discrete groups like this one, and these functions probably have some good analytic properties. Uh, we want them real analytic, satisfy eigenvalues for certain Laplacian and so on. Uh, so they can also be studied analytically. And because of this, their analytic nature, the connection to L-series is much more direct. <coughs> and whenever I have associated an L-series to such an automorphic representation, its analytic properties are known. Again, it's initially defined in some right half plane, but it can be shown to have analytic continuation to the whole complex plane and to satisfy the sort of functional equation we're looking for. So whenever we prove uh, a Galois representation is automorphic, one immediately deduces uh, good properties of its L-series, the sort we were looking for. And in some cases, it also provides a small dimensional examples. It also provides a good link, well, probably the only method that's really been known, to study these uh, questions of the relation of special values to the Diophantine properties of the variety, but it's not uh, clear to me how general a phenomenon that is. In the m certainly been very useful in low dimensions, but what I don't know how general it would be. Well, I, I should have said this conjecture uh, is no, was, was known in the case n equals 1 when, they, when it was made. It was probably about the only evidence that existed for it. It seemed to me a very bold conjecture at the time. Uh, there's now considerable evidence for it in the, in the case of two-dimensional representations, thanks to the work of uh, Carey and Vandenberger and Mark Kissing and Matt Hemerton. Uh, it's not completely solved in the case n equals 2, but uh, majority of the cases are now settled uh, for n equals 2. But beyond n equals 2, very, very little is known connect break worlds, solutions to polynomial congruences, representations of Galois groups to this analytic world. So because of that, uh, let me consider a slightly weaker conjecture, <coughs> which we should think should come from geometry and should have all these good properties, knowing that it should be unramified almost everywhere in Durham. And then... <coughs> Well, I still want to deduce that it's pure in the sense of Deline. But instead of asking for it to be automorphic, uh, I'm going to ask technically that, there's a f that it becomes auto automorphic after a finite base change. So you can think of this as saying that after losing a certain small amount of information, it's, it's connected to this analytic world. But we don't get quite as much information as as uh, oops sorry, as uh, as one would really like. And if we have this slightly weaker conclusion, I will say that rho is potentially automorphic. Now, the first real question is: Is this any use? I mean, we know that automorphy gives a lot of uh, uh, has a lot of consequences. Does potential automorphy and uh, Maybe the biggest surprise of this story is that potential automorphy seems to have nearly as many uh, useful consequences as automorphy d does. Um, one can again uh, deduce the uh, meromorphic continuation and functional equation for the L-series. It's slightly weaker information. We no, long we no longer know that the L-series is, uh, 
is holomorphic. We can no longer control the poles, but at least we do get the meromorphic continuation and, um, and, we, and the functional equation. Um, it has uh, many other uh, <coughs> useful consequences. You can use it to control finiteness questions concerning the Galois representations. Um, and in fact, it was a, a crucial, the carré van Berger proof of the fontaine meser conjecture for many cases for GL2 went via this. One first establishes potential automorphy and then uh, sort of bootstraps up to that for, for the full thing. And I've just noted here that the, the, the deduction from, from this weaker form of automorphy of the control of the L function combines uh, Brouwer's old theorem on, on the characters of finite groups, the work on L series, automorphic L series of Gobo and Jacquet that I mentioned before, and Langland's theory of base change. Um, <coughs> okay, well, we weakened the uh, conjecture in the hope of actually being able to prove something. So then the question is, can one prove something? So I want to describe a, a recent theorem in the setting of n-dimensional representations that does give <coughs> a potential automorphy. Uh, so I, I have a continuous irreducible L-adic representation, sort of thing that might well have come from counting uh, solutions to polynomial congruences. And I'm going to give various conditions we need to assume to, to obtain uh, potential automorphy. Well, first we need it to be unramified almost everywhere. We expect that's necessary. That's an uh, entirely harmless condition. Secondly, I need it uh, to be crystalline with uh, bounded Hodge-Tate numbers. So this is a site strengthening of the Durham condition. It doesn't I don't see it as too serious a, a, a strengthening because usually these things come with one for each prime L. Typically come from looking at the cohomology of a variety. And if I choose L large enough, uh, these additional conditions will be automatically satisfied. So in practical applications, you just can obtain this by choosing L large. Well, you need L to be large compared with the dimension, but again, that's not too serious because you just choose, you've got infinitely many L, so you just choose a sufficiently large one. Uh, now we come to, well, <coughs> I also need, if I take the reduction of the representation, it will automatically uh, stabilize a lattice. If you have any, uh, just for topological reasons, if you're <coughs> a representation of a compact group, you can find an invariant lattice, and then you can reduce it mod L, so you get a representation over the finite field with L elements. And I want some irreducibility condition here, not slightly stronger than irreducible. Irreducible when uh, restricted to the cyclotomic field with L elements. So again, uh, this is uh, probably not so serious, because in any family of representations as L varies, if the family is a family of irreducible representations, this will be true. Uh, for a set of L of uh, Dirichlet density 1. So almost most L will satisfy this in practical examples, so it's not, <coughs> you might consider it not too serious. But now we come to the uh, serious restrictions. First of all, we need to assume regularity. So regularity means the Hodge-Tate numbers are all different. Put another way, if you think in terms of the Hodge decomposition, it means the the dimension of each HPQ is either 0 or 1. So that is a very uh, serious restriction. I mean, it's true for elliptic curves, but for curves of any higher genus, it won't be true. So this theorem is, is no use for most curves of, of genus greater than 1. And <coughs> this does seem to be a, a, a fundamental stumbling block at the moment, and interestingly, a stumbling block on both sides. If you, on the algebraic number theory side, if you don't have this condition, 
it's very hard to move the Gawa representation. These Gawa representations come in sort of continuous families. And big part of the proof of this is to move them around. And if, there are, if the Hodge state numbers are distinct, you've got a good chance of being able to move them around a lot. Whereas once they, the Hodge state numbers start doubling up, they start becoming very rigid. In fact, if you have one in characteristic zero, there's often sort of no expectation that you should be able to lift it up to characteristic zero at all. And, and they become much more... <coughs> if you try and count the number of eladic representations of given hodge tate numbers and given conductor, the behavior becomes highly erratic as soon as the hodge tate numbers double up. Whereas if you don't do that, they seem to fit in... You seem to be able to predict the numbers much more... They're much more uniform. Somehow things with that with almost as if things with equal Hodge state numbers don't really deserve to exist at all. They only exist when some accident happens. On the automorphic side, uh, you, there's an apparently entirely different reason why they're, they're, they're hard to, <coughs> to see. On the automorphic side, uh, if you have distinct Hodge Tate numbers, if the automorphic form is regular, you can usually move it onto <coughs> a group which has a, sh using functoriality, a group which has a Shimura variety. You can start seeing it in algebraic geometry. Um, this allows you to prove arithmetic properties of the thing. But in the case when the Hodge Tate numbers double up, in the vast majority of cases, uh, it's no, there's no known method to see the thing in any way that you can control its arithmetic properties. So I'd like to give the example of a, a curve of genus 3. If you want to control H1 of a typical curve of genus 3, I can see absolutely no way to begin at the moment. Because, for instance, the automorphic form is some analytic function that I have... That nobody knows how you would begin to prove it has the... the for instance, the Fourier coefficients are algebraic numbers. And uh, secondly, in a similar spirit, the thing needs to be self-dual and odd. So self-dual means it preserves up to scalar, either an alternating or symmetric pairing, and <coughs> then it will have some multiplier character. In, this, in the sim case of a symplectic pairing, you want the multiplier character to be odd, which means that the value at complex conjugation should be minus 1, has to be plus or minus 1 in the case of a... Uh, or orthogonal pairing, the value at complex conjugation has to be plus one. Uh, this is very similar to, to this. It, again, if this fails, the deformation theory of the Galois representation it's become, suddenly becomes very rigid. You can't move it around much, uh, get some traction with it. On the other hand, uh, well, I... And it's again true on the, probably on the automorphic side, it's hard to see these, uh, these, uh, uh, these auto, the corresponding automorphic forms in some way that you can get a handle on their algebraic properties. On, on the other hand, I'm tended to see this as less serious than this. There are things you can begin to try to do here. You can just add rho to its dual and force this condition somehow. Then you'll start violating this, but... Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I, s I somehow see this as the more fundamental of the two in some way, but very just feeling. OK, well, when one has these various conditions, you <coughs> it is true that the, the uh, Gawa representation is uh, potentially automorphic, and you can start drawing these various conclusions about the L series and so on. And as I say, these first... Ones I don't see as being so serious, but these ones are a sort of fundamental obstruction to the theory at the moment. As I say, this theorem is most powerful when you apply it to a family. So, sorry. Uh, does this mean you've removed the bigness condition on the image? Oh, I sh yeah, I should have said... Yeah, well, it means Jack Thorne uh, has removed the bigness condition on the image. Uh, so for those... Um, so four of us announced a slightly weaker theorem than this uh, um, in the spring. Uh, 
which was very similar except uh, this condition was, was a slightly more stringent form of this condition, uh, uh, which again you, you could usually apply, uh, you could usually, use, still didn't usually matter because you could usually apply it in families for different L and it was usually satisfied, but the uh, um, condition was what we called bigness. But Jack Thorne has uh, made me feel very stupid and realize that if you, that if you did things slightly differently, you, you've, got a mu you've got a much cleaner result. Uh, okay, I, so I was going to say that th this... Uh, um, Uh, is most effective when you have a compatible family of Galois representations. Um, <coughs> so let me just say loosely that if you have a regular odd self-dual irreducible motif over Q, then it's potentially automorphic and its L function uh, has meromorphic continuation and satisfies a functional equation. Um, so I think these should be fairly clear what these things mean. Irreducible, I, I have to take to mean that all its L-adic, or at least uh, positive density, for positive density of L, its L-adic representations are irreducible, which I, I'm, well, that's what this means. I there might be I other. Yeah. About regular? Yes. So yes. So in general, in, in general, I see no way to do that because I. So I, I mean, maybe you can re re relax regularity a little bit. Maybe dimension two for the yeah, Hodge spaces is, uh, is okay. So maybe genus two curves. Yeah. Well, for what you say, genus two curves would be it would be all right. I mean, given a genus two curve, in theory, you could do a finite computation and show it was modular, um, <laughs> because. These two you can see as limit of discrete series, but beyond that, no. I mean, I mean, it's not even clear to me you can compute the automorphic forms in question. And even if you could do that, there's certainly no aladic representation uh, attached to them. <coughs> okay. Well, I was, I was going to make say slightly more precisely what I mean by. Uh, uh, this statement, given that motive is a, is, has a meaning but, but is somewhat abstract, you can make this entirely concrete by talking about compatible system of L-adic representations, which is what you would get uh, from the cohomology of a motive if you had a motive. So if, if I take a number field, which will be the field of coefficients, and a finite set of primes, which will be the bad primes, by a weakly compatible system, I mean an L-adic representation rho lambda for each prime lambda of M, which will be <coughs> unramified outside S, with the following properties that if I take a good prime, one that's not in S and away from the residue characteristic of lambda, this representation will be unramified and this special conjugacy class will have a characteristic polynomial with rational coefficients not in this eladic field and should be independent of lambda. Uh, that all these things should be Dirac in the sense I was talking about before, and most of them should be something stronger. Whenever there's good reduction, they should be crystalline. And the Hodge Tate numbers of the <coughs> uh, these things should be independent of lambda, so they should be computing the Hodge numbers of the motive, so they shouldn't depend on lambda. And I call such thing a weakly compatible system of analytic representation. Certainly, the cohomology of any variety will form, the Eladic cohomology will form a weakly compatible system in this sense. So can you explain what is an R lambda? Which? Yeah, like that. What's the lambda? Oh, M lambda, algebraic closure of M lambda. What is M lambda? M was the field of coefficients, so it could be Q or something, but it, 
Uh, no, M is a number field, so and there will be one. Well, lambda will be a prime of M. Yeah. M lambda will be the completion of M at oh, lambda, okay. and bar will be its algebraic closure. I mean, maybe I should have just stuck with M being Q and lambda running over the primes L and just going into GLN QL, but I, uh, I mean, if you start, if you start splitting, the, the Aladic cohomology of a variety will be defined over QL, but if you start splitting it up into its irreducible pieces so you can apply this, you can certainly find that it's no longer rational over Q, so you need slightly greater generality. So if I have a weakly compatible system of Aladic representations in this sense, such that each of them is irreducible, or at least uh, they're <coughs> irreducible uh, for a positive Dirichlet density of lambda, such that uh, each of them uh, is regular in the sense I said before, the Hodge-Tate numbers are all different, and given that the Hodge-Tate numbers are independent of lambda was part of the definition of the compatible system, that's uh, automatic. And each uh, row lambda should be self-dual and odd, then <coughs> the, uh, the whole system is potentially automorphic. Well, uh, I wanted to, m to maybe finish with uh, an example uh, to show that this theorem is, uh, does have some implications for, for practical questions. So if you apply it to the self-product, you take an elliptic curve and take an arbitrary self-product of it, well, this won't quite be regular, but if you take the part of the cohomology fixed by the symmetric group permuting uh, these factors, that will in turn out to be regular, certainly self-dual. So the theorem does <coughs> apply to that, and if you apply it to each of these self-products of arbitrary length, it implies the so-called Sato-Take conjecture on the number of points of an elliptic curve over a finite field P as P varies. So more precisely, this says that it's known by Hasse going back to the 1930s that the number of points, solutions to this uh, cubic equation in two variables modulo P will be approximately P. In fact, the difference between the number and 1 plus P uh, will be bounded by 2 root P. And if I normalize it by the root P, I get a number in the interval minus 2, 2. So the error, the distribution of the errors of the point count compared with the, with the sort of obvious guess of 1 point P, start to take congestion as it's distributed in this uh, interval according to the, this semicircular rule. Precisely that means if I have a continuous function on this interval, integrating it against this measure is the same as averaging it over these numbers as P varies over the primes. Um, but this, for just an elliptic curve, you really need to know the automorphy of, for all the self-products of E of arbitrary length, which means it's a problem that involves GLN for all n, not just GL2, the cohomology of H1 of E being two-dimensional. So this we actually uh, were able to prove a few years ago. Uh, we didn't need the full force of the theorem I, I just stated. But the original arguments in this case made used strongly at a number of points the precise form of this uh, the fact that we were using a self-product of, of elliptic curves. It applied to self-products of elliptic curves and one other particular family of varieties, so-called dwarf family, that we studied. But it, it, it was in no sense a general theorem, and it's taken us a number of years to be able to, to improve the argument so that it now uh, applies generally, subject, as I say, to these uh, two conditions, regularity, and uh, odd self-duality. Well, I, I do have some slides about the proof, but I think probably it's better for me to stop a few minutes early uh, before getting even more technical. Well, thank yeah. you very much.
we, we do use the Dork. No, we absolutely, we do use the Dork family. But before, the theorem only applied to self-products of elliptic curve and elements of the Dork family. Any other motif, regular motif, we didn't say anything about. And now we're able to apply that analysis of the Dork family, but to any regular motive. So, I mean, a priori, it's rich enough to, to, to get any of these regular things because you, I mean, it's, it's rather technical why it wasn't working before. Uh, I mean, it's more in some sense, it was more surprising that it wasn't working before on, a very, on, on, a, on the highest level. Uh, did, did you? Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. This. Yes, I'm not sure. Well, what? Uh, well, let me see. So, first of all, if it's regular and the and the um, residual representation is irreducible, I think you're okay. Is that right, Sheka? Uh, now, f if it's if it's, if it's not regular and even, uh, you're in trouble. If it's not regular and odd, yeah, but that isn't, that's still not completely general. Uh, I mean, if you knew it, if you, it should be then an art in representation. If you know it's an art in representation, you're fine, thanks to Shekhar and, and Jean-Pierre. Yeah, but odd. yeah, an odd, I mean, yes, uh, yes. No, I don't think that's fair because <laughs> if it if it's if it's even, the Hodge Tate numbers have both yeah, to be Bobby zero and zero. Oh, you're missing half the art in oh, represent Bobby half the art in representations. <laughs> you're missing yes.